No, not everyone was here at the debate, but many of you, if not most of you were, that took place, uh, ended this last week. There was one thing that was brought up twice during the debate that I supposedly taught, that somehow Jesus died spiritually and thus was separated from God. It came as a result of a conversation between Steve Baisden and myself that took place in January of 2014. Uh, when Neubauer stated that I held that, I was shaking my head no. I don't know if y'all could see that, but uh, it was because of the rules of the debate I could not respond at that time. I can now, though. I'm going to read you the entire conversation from which they accused me of teaching that doctrine. Steve Bazin asked me if I was on right now, and I said, yes, Steve. He asked, have you been following my conversation with Scott Claft and Eric Ferrier? And I asked about Psalm 22. He said, about Jesus being forsaken, Matthew 27, 46. And he asked, yeah, what am I missing? And I stated, I have not really been following it. I read Scott's first statement about it, and that's about it. Now then, as an aside, it is a discussion about Jesus' statement, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? There are many brethren uh, who hold that that statement is a statement saying this is the fulfillment of Psalm 22, the entirety of the psalm. That's what the discussion was about. Uh, as I said, I did not, had not read all of it and did not read all of it. I know the positions of both people, of both sides, and there wasn't any reason to, and I wasn't going to get involved in it. But, so I said, I had told him I have not really been following it. I read Scott's first statement about it, and that's about it. So he asked, okay, what is your take on this? Did God forsake Jesus while he was on the cross? I said, I believe so, Steve. However, I do understand the argument. And he said, yep, me too, thank you. I will not be running around saying that Michael Hatcher agrees with me. I was just wondering if I was all alone on this. Thank you. And I stated, you're not the only one. I would say that their view is by far the minority view. Their view being that it refers to the fulfillment of Psalm 22, that is. And Steve said, I didn't know that. The majority would say that God for a moment forsook Jesus because he took our sins upon himself. And he stated, I have not been around the brotherhood like you have been, and some of these things I am finding that some believe baffles me. That is my understanding also. Again, thanks. Have a good day. Um, <clears throat> there's a, a few more statements, but that's it, really. Now then, after reading that, would you say that I said that Jesus died spiritually as I was accused of two different times in that debate? I probably would have dropped it at that point, but after the debate, they had printed out this conversation, which was fine. I had printed it out also for Daniel's use, if need be. And I mentioned that they had misrepresented what I believe. I do not believe what they accused me of. And they basically said that I did, that that was proof of it. And that they were going to continue to tell people that's what I believe. Now then, you've heard it for yourself as to the entire conversation, basically. And 
That's just very simply not what I believe. There are many ways in which to understand the fact that God forsook Jesus. Uh, in fact, uh, if I remember correctly, Brother Denham holds that same view, that it's not a fulfillment, or Jesus is saying this is a fulfillment of Psalm 22, as many brethren hold, but that he would take the same position that I would in that regard. One of the ways, just to give an illustration in which that could be understood, is the very fact, for example, if you recall when they come out to arrest Jesus, Jesus made the statement, I can now ask the Father and he would send 12 legions of angels and deliver me. Did he do that? Did God deliver him from that death in that sense? Well, no, he didn't. He forsook him from that aspect. He did not deliver. Yet remember, when Satan was tempting Jesus, he told him, cast yourself down from the mountain, and the scriptures say that he will give his angels charge concerning thee, lest thou dash thy foot against the stone. In other words, there's a protection that is there that God gives. God withdrew that so that he did die the death of the cross and forsook him from that standpoint. But that's not saying that, God, that Jesus died spiritually and separated from God. That's just a heresy that we've fought for years and years uh, some teaching that, for example, in 2 Corinthians 5, where, Jesus, uh, where Paul talks about the fact that Jesus took our sins upon himself. He died as a propitiation for us. Well, does that mean Jesus died a sinner? Well, no, of course not. And we fought that for years because some people took that position that Jesus took upon our, our sins upon himself, that made Jesus a sinner. No, it didn't. He was not a sinner. He never sinned, could not sin, and yet be what he is. And this idea that Jesus died spiritually comes from the same type of a thinking that stated Jesus is a sinner. And if you take Neubauer and Basden's position, he had to sin in order to experience what we experience, which is something that he advocated during the debate. If he had to experience what we experience to deliver us or be our Savior, does that, did that mean he also has, had to experience torment? And would he not have had to experience eternal torment? Their position just destroys the deity of Jesus Christ. But uh, I wanted to clarify that before it goes any further. And if someone should actually hear that I've taught this doctrine, well, it is a misrepresentation. And uh, I'll say it is a flat-out lie. I've, I told them specifically, that is not my view. That's not what I said. They were reading into it. Those were the terms that I used. And so if they continue, as Mr. Bazin said he was going to, then they are, it's a lie, because they know it is a falsehood. Um, but I would say that's the type of men that you're dealing with in this regard. And it really is sad. Um, Okay, now then, with that as an aside, before I get all upset, <laughs> because uh, that is to know that people are going to deliberately misrepresent what you believe and what you teach does, is 
should be upsetting to anyone. But uh, well, in this lesson this morning, and probably, Lord willing, next Sunday morning, I want us to consider our transition and what it will be like. The word transition, as used in this lesson, very simply is to change from one state to another. And we want to look at it primarily directing it from the standpoint of those who are Christians. We will mention those who are not Christians as well, but our primary focus will be on those who are Christians. And we want to look at it from at least a couple of different areas. The first of those, what is our transition when one obeys the gospel? In obedience to the gospel, we must, upon our faith in God and in Jesus Christ as God's Son and the fact that He died for our sins, we repent of our sins, that is, a turning away from them, to turn and to live for God in God's appointed way, make a confession of our faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, and then we are baptized in water for the forgiveness of our sins. But that brings us to that first aspect that at baptism, one has the remission of his past sins. When Jesus gave the Great Commission, go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. The word saved there, when we consider it within the context and within parallel passages, we learn that it is dealing with salvation from past sins. Salvation can have an application of a salvation in heaven, an eternal salvation. But in Mark 16, 16, it's not dealing with that. It's dealing with our past sins. We see the, the truthfulness of that when we turn to Acts, the second chapter. And we hear Peter's sermon and the effect that it had upon the Jews so much so that they cried out, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 37. Peter's response is to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The remission of sins. He's dealing with sins that we have committed. Those are remitted. They are taken away. They exist no longer. The payment has been paid in full by Jesus Christ. Well, there's the remission, though, of past sins that he's dealing with. It's not dealing with anything that we would see in the future, as some have erroneously taught that we have, in, at that act of baptism, we have not only forgiveness of past sins, but we have any forgiveness of future sins. That's the old once saved, always saved doctrine of Calvinism. And it was false when they taught it. It's false when we teach it. But he's dealing with those sins, those things that you committed in the past. They are taken away. They're forgiven. The word, in fact, the word forgiven and the word that's translated here in Acts 2.38, remiss or remission comes from the exact same Greek word. There is no difference in them. You have forgiveness. You have remission of sins. But as we would see in Acts 8th chapter, that doesn't necessarily mean forgiveness of future sins because Simon the sorcerer, who was baptized based upon his faith and repentance and confession, Yet he fell into sin when he saw the apostles being able to lay hands on someone else and imparting to them miraculous powers. And thus, what we find is he wanted that power, and he offered to pay the apostles for that power. And in doing so, he sinned. His heart was not right with God, Peter tells him. He's in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. Why? Because he thought that that gift of God, that ability to pass on miraculous powers to others, was a thing that he could 
buy for himself, and he could not. And thus he sinned. And so the remission of sins, or in Mark's account, Mark 16, 16, salvation, we're dealing with salvation of past sins. We have that in that act of baptism. Also at baptism, in that obedience to the gospel, one is added to the church. Well, first, he comes into a relationship with deity. We would see that in Matthew 28 and verse 19, when it states that, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, the Son, and the, of the Holy Ghost. That phrase, in the name of, in the King James, literally into the name of, it deals with coming into a relationship with deity. You're coming into a relationship with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. John addresses it not in relationship to baptism, but those who abide in the doctrine of Christ in 2 John verse 9, that they hath the Father and the Son. In other words, they remain in fellowship with or that relationship with deity. How? When they abide in the doctrine of Christ. That one who transgresses that doctrine of Christ, though, he hath not God. Or he does not have that relationship with deity as the one who is faithful and who abides in that doctrine does. But Matthew 28 and verse 19 is dealing with that relationship with deity. That at baptism, we are coming into a relationship with deity, with the Father, with the Son, and with the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. That's when that relationship takes place, though. Very powerful argument that prior to baptism, you do not have that relationship with God. That at that act of baptism, that baptism is, is that which places us into that relationship that you did not have previously. So we come into at that act of baptism because our sins are forgiven. We are saved from those past sins. We then now have a relationship with deity. We are also then added to the church. In Acts, the second chapter, when Peter preaches this sermon and the, r brings about that response, men and brethren, what shall we do? And he tells them to repent, be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. He tells them, here is what's going to come as a result of your baptism, you repenting and being baptized. We find in verse 40 that with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. The idea of saving themselves goes right back to what Jesus had stated there in Mark 16, 16, that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Save yourselves from this untoward generation, this wicked generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized. The same day there were added to them about 3,000 souls. What happened? They obeyed the gospel. They received the word. The result of that is baptism. Just as Peter had told them in verse 38. And in that act of baptism, they had the forgiveness of their sins. They were saved from this wicked generation. Now then... It also adds that they were added unto them. But what were they added to? Well, we find as we continue on in Acts 2 what it is that they were added to in verse 47 when he says, Praising God and having favor with all the people and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved, or literally those that were being saved. So as someone was saved, that is, saved from his past sins in that act of baptism whereby he comes into that relationship with deity, he then is added by God to the church. Those that were being saved were added by God to the church. 
Church is not something that you join. You don't, as the old statement goes, join the church of your choice. There is only one church. We find in Ephesians 4 and verse 4 and 5. That church is the church of Christ, Romans 16 and verse 16. But it's not something we join. It's something that God adds us to when we are obedient to the gospel. And in that act of baptism, when our sins are washed away, we come into that relationship with God, and God then adds us to the church. In 1 Corinthians, the 12th chapter, and verse 13, he mentions that for by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. The idea for by one spirit is that the spirit is setting forth the word of God by which we come to faith, and through that faith we are baptized into the body. But we also find out in Ephesians 1, and 23, and Colossians 1, verse 18, that the body is the church. Therefore, when he says we're baptized into one body, he's talking about we're being baptized into one church. Thus, that act of baptism is that act which adds us to that church, that body of Christ. And it is that body of Christ, the church, that Christ purchased with his own precious blood. Acts 20 and verse 28 Paul would tell the Ephesian elders to take heed unto themselves and all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. Christ purchased the church with his blood. He paid the price for it. And now then, those who respond in obedience to God, respond faithfully to him, to be baptized in water for the forgiveness of their past sins. They have that forgiveness. They are saved. They now enter into that relationship with God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. They are purchased with the blood of Christ. They enter into that church which he purchased with his own precious blood. In Colossians, the first chapter... In verses 12 through verse 14, we see also that at that point of baptism, we are translated into the kingdom of God's Son. When he says, giving thanks unto the Father, which hath made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in, life, in light, who hath delivered us from the power of darkness and translated us into the kingdom of his dear Son, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. So here in Christ, we have the redemption through the blood of Christ. What did Christ purchase? He purchased the church with his blood. We have redemption through that blood. We have the forgiveness of sins. Where? When we obey the gospel of Jesus Christ in baptism. But what does he say? He says we've been translated from that power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. We start learning then that the kingdom and the church are one and the same institution. We don't have time to go into a detailed study of that, but if you look at Colossians, uh, the first chapter where it states this, and that they had been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son, he's writing to the saints at Colossae. We find that the saints are those who comprise the church in 1 Corinthians 1st chapter, verses 1 and 2. And thus, those individuals who are in the church are those individuals who have been translated from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. They've been translated into the church. Thus, at that point of baptism, coming into that relationship with deity, we become a member and we enter into that spiritual family of God. In 2 Corinthians 5th chapter and verse 17, Paul would say, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
If you would, for just a second, think back to that which we just read in Colossians, the first chapter and verse 13 in particular, that he hath translated us from the power of darkness into the kingdom of his dear son. And then consider what he, Paul says here, that old things are passed away. All things have become new. What are those old things? That's that power of darkness, sin and wickedness. Now, what did Peter on the day of Pentecost tell those Jews? Save yourselves from this wicked, this untoward generation. There's that power of darkness that's within the world. We've been translated from that power of darkness into the kingdom, the church of God's dear Son. The old things are passed away. All things are become new. But he says that in Christ we become thus a new creature because of that newness of life. Because that old has passed away and all things become new. We are now in Christ. We are a new creature. We become children of God. Galatians 3 and verse 26. That in Christ Jesus you are all children of God by the faith. In Christ Jesus. Thus by God's word. That which has been revealed by the Spirit. Remember that in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13, for by one Spirit, the Spirit is revealing that Word. And through that Word, we become children of God in Christ Jesus. But it's in Christ that it's found, where we become a, a new creature, a child of God. Before we go on, though, let's mention 1 John 3 and verse 1. When John would say, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We have by God's love now been called his child. The child of God, the son of God. We thus are that new creature in Christ. But how do we get into Christ? Well, again, we would see in Galatians 3 and verse 27, For as many of you as have been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized or have put on Christ. Now it says, In Christ we become a child of God by the faith, by God's word that was revealed by the Spirit. Now, how did we become that child of God? That's verse 27, when you're baptized into Christ. Thus, in Romans 6, chapter, in verse 3 and verse 4, Paul talks about, therefore, if any... Uh, well, started quoting and left me... Uh, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Christ, were baptized into his death, that therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Now notice that. We are baptized into Christ. What happens? We die to that old man so that we can be raised out of that water grave of baptism to walk in newness of life. What is it? Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Where? In Christ Jesus. But how do we get there? In that act of baptism is how we get into Christ. Where old things are passed away and all things are become new. Where we die to that old man of sin and we're raised to walk in newness of life. That newness of life, being a child of God now. No longer in the kingdom and under the power of sin and of Satan, but now under, the, under freely submitting ourselves to the power of God within our life. We thus put off that old nature, and we take upon ourselves that nature of the Father. There's that newness of life. In 2 uh, Peter, the first chapter, in verse 3 and 4, 
Paul, uh, Peter would say, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that's in this world through lust. Here's that corruption that's in this world through lust. What is it? That's the power of darkness. That's that sin and that wickedness, this untoward generation that Peter mentioned there in Acts 2 and verse 40. We can escape that. How? In that act of baptism, in becoming a child of God. So what do we do? We now take upon him the divine nature. Here's the nature, the characteristics, the attributes of deity, of God. And we've study and we learn those attributes, those characteristics, and we apply those characteristics and that attributes to our life. Thus we become a partaker of his divine nature. We've been translated from the power of darkness and translated in the kingdom of, of his dear son to be a partaker of that divine nature, now a child of God and no longer a child of Satan. Romans first chapter, in verses 1 and verse 2, Paul would say, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your body as a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and uh, perfect will of God. We're transformed, what? From that old man of sin, from the power of darkness. We've been translated into the kingdom of his dear son. We've been transformed by the renewing of our mind, the changing of our mind. Our lives are now new. Old things are passed away. All things have become new. There's the renewing of your mind. And what is a partaker now of God's divine nature? Notice, if you will, Colossians, the third chapter, verses 1 through verse 5. Paul would write, If ye then be risen with Christ. And just as a side, here is this aspect, risen with Christ. Where's the language we heard that from? Well, it's in the act of baptism. Then in baptism, Romans 6, verse 4, While we've been baptized into the death of Christ, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, we also should walk in newness of life. Christ was raised up. We are raised up from that watery grave of baptism. So if you've been risen with Christ in that act of baptism, what do we do? We seek those things that are above where Christ sitteth at the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above and not on things of the earth. For, now notice this, ye are dead. What is it? That old man died. We've been baptized into the death of Christ, and so at that act of baptism, we are dead to that old man of sin now, to be raised to seek those things that are above. And so we set our affections on things above, not on things of the earth. For you are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, word mortify again, put to death. You're, therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. In other words, you die to those things in that act of baptism. And you're raised with Christ to walk in that newness of life, that newness of life where we are setting our affections on things above and we are being a partaker of God's divine nature. And so while we are in this world, we don't leave this world at that act of baptism. Even though we're in the world, we're not of the world. Jesus, in talking to his apostles and then later in praying for them, as recorded in John the 15th chapter, he's speaking to his apostles, but applicable to us. Verses 18 and verse 19, he tells them, If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own. 
But because you're not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world, therefore the world hateth you. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. That's why he's telling the apostles. If you're of the world, the world would hate you, but you're not of the world. I've called you out of the world, not physically out of the world, but from your lifestyle, you've died to that old man of sin, the ways of the world. You're now living and setting your affections on things above. As is in his high priestly prayer in John 17, as he's praying for these same apostles, again, applicable to us as well, but specifically dealing with the apostles. He says in verses 15 and 16, I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from evil. They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Jesus recognized these apostles, they're not of the world. We as Christians are not of the world. And so we're not thinking about the things of the world. We're not living according to the ways of the world. We're not acting that way. Our mindset is different from the people of the world. Our attitudes, our characteristics, our nature has changed. So we become a partaker of God's divine nature. And as John would write in 1 John 2, verses 15 through 17, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of the Father abideth forever. The will of God abideth forever. We want to abide forever with God in eternity. We're going to have to be baptized so that we can have the forgiveness of our sins. We can come into that relationship with deity. We're translated into the church that Jesus Christ purchased with his own blood. Dying to that old man of sin, raised to become a partaker of God's divine nature escaping the corruption that's in this world through lust, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, escaping that lust to do the will of the Father. If you have not been baptized thus for the remission of your sins this morning, we would encourage you to make that transformation within your life. Make that transition from this world of darkness and the power of darkness. Escape the wickedness that's in this world through lust in that act of baptism and become a partaker of God's divine nature. If you have become a Christian, but you're like Simon and allowed sin to come back into your life and rule and reign over you instead of humbly submitting yourselves into the will of God. And why not repent of your sins? Let us pray with you for the forgiveness of them. So if we can help you in this way, we would encourage you to come as we stand and sing the invitation song.